Good afternoon, everyone. Just got off the phone with fellow governors in the White House, and here's what we heard. Dr. Walensky talked about the CDC and the FDA's decision to approve boosters for anyone 18 and older, which Vermont had already moved forward on. Dr. Fauci stressed the importance of getting boosters because of some waning immunity. He pointed to a study in Israel that suggested that protection for those who got boosted is 11-fold higher against infection and 20-fold against severe illness. The chair of the NGA, Governor Hutchinson from Arkansas, along with a number of other governors, asked about the supply of rapid tests. And the White House indicated they were putting uh, millions into purchasing more, which they hoped to quadruple supply by December. They also reported that Merck and Pfizer antiviral pills could be approved by the FDA within the next couple of weeks. Next, as you know, yesterday I brought the legislature back for a special session in order to consider a bill, which I signed this morning, by the way, as a compromise between our extreme differences of opinion regarding COVID strategy. Legislative leaders believe we need to return to a state of emergency, impose a statewide mass mandate, and a host of other restrictions, and I don't. But as you've heard me say repeatedly, masking when inside in public spaces is a good idea right now because masks work. But at this point in the pandemic, mandates won't. And I think they'll be divisive and counterproductive. That's why I've been clear at this point, I see no reason to re-implement broad mandates on Vermonters. We have the highest vaccination rate and one of the lowest hospitalization rates in the nation. At the request of the League of Cities and Towns, I offered a compromise to the legislature to give municipalities the authority, if they choose, to pass their own mask rule. As a reminder, we gave municipalities the same option last year. Several took advantage without any major issues arising. If they choose to again, it's their choice. If they don't want to, they don't have to. That doesn't change the fact that as we've done for the last several weeks, along with the CDC, we'll continue to encourage wearing a mask indoors and especially around people you don't know. I also saw, along with the olive branch I offered, the Senate passed a resolution calling on me to take, quote, all possible public health measures to reduce COVID-19 spread. As a reminder, all measures means doing some of the things we did a year ago, like banning gatherings, closing businesses, requiring remote learning, and more. Think about that, <clears throat> Vermont the state with the highest vaccination and booster rates, the state that has the highest rate of testing in the country, the state that has the lowest hospitalizations and deaths throughout the pandemic, and still has maintained among the lowest rates during Delta. With all that data, 17 senators think we should go back to mandates that almost no other states have in place. So to be clear, I'm not willing to move us backwards. And frankly, I think it sends the wrong message about how effective vaccines are and snatches hope from the hands of Vermonters. We know so much more about this virus today than we did 20 months ago and who's most at risk. We're in a different place, leading the nation in many categories, which remains the most important mitigation tool we have. That's why my team continues to make vaccines and boosters as accessible as possible. And like I said, we're seeing Vermonters step up and lead the nation. And as we go into Thanksgiving, don't forget to take the steps we've talked about to keep your loved ones safe. First, make sure your group is vaccinated and boosted. As Dr. Fauci said yesterday, if everyone around your table is vaccinated, you shouldn't have to worry. Second, use testing as a tool. We've been promoting this ahead of the holidays. 
This is a staggering number. In the last week, we conducted 69,000 tests. That's over 10% of our population. This is a great way to ensure you don't spread the virus to more vulnerable family members at Thanksgiving. And most importantly, if you're sick, stay home. I know you want to see your family and friends, but if you have symptoms, please don't take the risk of spreading to vulnerable family members. Now, I want to be honest with you. As a result of Thanksgiving, we will probably see a higher number of cases next week and the week after. So we're asking you to help us keep that spike as low as we can and especially focus on protecting the elderly. Lastly, I want to express my thanks to Vermonters who continue to do the right thing. We'd be in a much different place if you hadn't stepped up and done your part. And thank you to all those who serve your community through your work or by volunteering. I know everyone is tired of dealing with COVID. But unfortunately, it's going to be with us for quite some time, just like other viruses like the flu. But doing your part in getting vaccinated has made a huge difference and will continue to help Vermont from going through what many other states and nations have. So again, I wish you and your families a healthy and happy holiday. And I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Kuchet for the modeling update. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so looking around uh, the country and the region, we can see that uh, COVID-19 cases uh, are on the rise, up about 15% across the board in the U.S. and up about 27% uh, in New England. Uh, here in Vermont, you'll see that uh, cases have remained uh, steady this past week. They are elevated um, at that higher level than we've seen. Uh, but up only about 4% over the week. So good that they remain stable after seeing those two weeks previously of uh, case growth uh, here in Vermont. Looking a little bit deeper into those numbers, uh, you can see on the next slide, uh, although cases are up 4%, as the governor said, testing is up quite a bit this week, up about 16%. Uh, so that has actually driven down our positivity rate uh, over the last week or so. That's, as you know, is something that we've been looking at closely. Uh, what's the amount of testing that's occurring? What's the amount of uh, what's the positivity rate uh, to try to get a sense of if uh, infections and if the virus is more or less prevalent in our community? So that is certainly a good indication there that um, we're not seeing the positivity rate go up as testing increases. Uh, so again, we'll keep a close eye on that, but uh, some uh, some good signs there in our data. Uh, when we look at the next slide, you'll see that um, the rates among those that are not fully vaccinated and those who are fully vaccinated continue to be quite wide. Uh, right now, it's 4.4 times greater. Uh, so 4.4 times, times greater for those who are not fully vaccinated in terms of those who are fully vaccinated. And you'll see that their rates uh, went up about 11% this week, while the fully vaccinated rate declined slightly down a little bit more than a percent. Again, looking a little bit more closely at our case data by age, uh, you can see that the age group that has been leading uh, in terms of the highest case rates uh, for much of the Delta wave continues to do so. That five to 11 year old age group, uh, their rates are about double uh, all of those other age groups that we have here on the chart. So they continue to be high, uh, although you do see that they as well have been flat for this past week as well. So really critical as you can see to get that age group vaccinated as quickly as we can. Uh, and as you'll see on the next slide, we are off to a good start when we look to ourselves compared to the rest of the country. Uh, Vermont, uh, as of today, per the CDC, is number one in terms of five to 11 year old vaccinations at about 30% of the eligible population. You can see that much of New England is doing very well too in terms of the uptake uh, of the vaccine among that age group. So very critical to get that population vaccinated. They're seeing the highest case rate still. And hopefully uh, once they are fully vaccinated, that will have a favorable impact on our cases. Another important age group to take a look at is that 65 and older uh, group. So you can see here over the last seven days, the 65 and older cases have actually gone down 14%, while all of the other age groups have gone up by varying degrees. Again, that 65 and older rate is really important. They um, are 
the most vulnerable of our population, uh, most vulnerable to the worst outcomes of COVID, uh, ICU usage, fatalities, and the like. So seeing that age group uh, stay stable and even decrease a bit, certainly encouraging. And as we've said before, uh, not a coincidence. When you look at the uh, booster rates among that population, as you'll see on the next chart, Vermont has been leading the nation in those 65 and older getting their booster shot. Uh, right now, a little bit over 61% of those who are 65 and older who are fully vaccinated have received their booster. And that rate has been pretty consistent there, as you see on the slide, uh, and has continued to be uh, higher than the national average, outpacing the national, national average, and continues at a steady state. So encouraging sign there as well uh, in terms of uh, getting the most vulnerable uh, their booster shot. Looking around Vermont in terms of geography, you can see that uh, the areas of the state that have had higher case counts remain uh, higher, as, uh, particularly in the Northeast Kingdom, although there has been some improvement in Orleans County week over week. Uh, and then the uh, southwestern part of the state with Rutland and Bennington County uh, cases still remain elevated there. Looking across uh, at our higher education campuses, things are pretty quiet or at least consistent with what they have been. About 55 cases reported this week, down from 60 cases last week. Uh, and good to see that uh, those have leveled out after there was uh, a little bit of trouble uh, a couple of weeks ago on campus where we reported over 100 cases. So things pretty stable across the college campuses. And again, with their 95% vaccination rate, not all that surprising. Looking at our long-term care facilities, you'll see that uh, the numbers are down uh, overall when we look at the active outbreaks. So 181 down from 218 last week. The number of active outbreaks uh, are 12 down from 15 last week. But again, uh, many of these cases appear to be among staff. When you look at the next slide, you'll see that the rates among residents of long-term care facilities uh, have continued to remain low and are trending down uh, over the last week and two weeks. So again, good news there, consistent with our 65 and older data, that those that are the most vulnerable uh, continue to uh, have their rates stay steady, uh, or in both of these cases this week actually go down. Uh, looking at statewide hospitalizations, you'll see that uh, they are up. The seven-day average is up about 17%. Uh, and then similarly, uh, the vast majority this week, 69% of those in the hospital uh, were among those that were not fully vaccinated. Looking at our ICU numbers, you can see that they are up likewise 12%. Uh, even greater percentage of those taking up ICU beds are not fully vaccinated, about 78%. But again, when you look over the last uh, six or seven weeks, you can see the ICU numbers have fluctuated up and down but they remain in that sort of constant um, area, which is good. And again, we think attributable to that 65 and older group having a really steady rate during this period of time as well. Looking at the next slide, this is looking at um, the availability of ICU beds across the state, looking at the number of COVID patients in the ICU, and then looking at the number of non-COVID patients in the ICU. So availability on the trend side has ticked up a bit over the last seven days, which is certainly good news. Uh, you can see the COVID numbers have remained pretty steady. And then you'll see that the vast majority of people in the ICU are being treated for something other than COVID. And those numbers have um, increased over the last three or four months uh, as uh, more and more people uh, are requiring hospitalization for things other than COVID. And that includes the ICU uh, as well. Looking at uh, the fatality numbers to date, we did unfortunately lose another 11 uh, people this week, seven of which were um, date of death were, did occur in the last seven days, uh, four of which were from a previous week, uh, but that does move our number up to uh, 30 deaths for the month of November uh, for Vermont. And then turning to our forecast, you'll see that uh, as it relates to last week, uh, we actually were trending right sort of in the lower end, kind of in the middle of the forecast. So that was certainly uh, good to see last week. If you remember, we trended on the higher side of our forecast. Uh, so again, consistent with um, some good news here in the data that things are consistent. Uh, but again, we're at a high level of cases. So as the governor said, important to be uh, careful this week with Thanksgiving upon us. And as you'll see from the current forecast for the week, um, still not anticipating cases to go down. And uh, Thanksgiving does provide a lot of uncertainty in terms of its uh, direct impact that it will have uh, on our cases here in Vermont uh, and around the region as well. And finally, turning to our vaccination uh, scorecards, you can see that uh, on vaccinations, we continue to be at the top or near the top uh, in many of these metrics. We mentioned also among five to 11 year olds, 
Uh, we are at the top in Vermont in terms of uh, first dose, so good news. And then finally, on the booster doses, we mentioned how we're number one on 65 and older, but uptake across the population is nation leading, which certainly is a good sign. Uh, but again, as we've uh, clarified, anyone 18 and older, six months out, uh, eligible for a booster and important for everyone across the population uh, to get one, uh, not just those who are the most vulnerable. So with that, I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon, everyone. As of today, 17,598 children ages 5 to 11 have received either their first dose of COVID vaccine or they have an appointment. That's just over 40% of all Vermont children ages 5 to 11 years old. In addition to doctor's offices, the vaccine is available through pharmacies, schools, and community-based clinics. You can make an appointment for your child by going online at healthvermont.gov slash kidsvaccine or by contacting your local pharmacy or doctor's office. You can also call the call center at 855-722-7878. Now I want to turn to booster doses and Dr. Levine will talk um, about why boosters are important and the encouraging results, as Commissioner Pichek had pointed out, the encouraging results we are seeing with boosters. So far, nearly 152,600 people have received boosters in Vermont. As Commissioner Pichek has pointed out, Vermont leads the nation in the percent of state's population receiving boosters along a variety of categories. Remember, you're eligible for a booster if you're 18 or over and it's been six months since your last shot of Moderna or Pfizer or two months in the case of J&J. &J. So please make an appointment. You can call 855-722-7878 or go, or go online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Now I wanna provide an update on our efforts to reduce the stress on Vermont's healthcare system. Recently, 80 additional subacute beds were staffed and filled at three locations throughout the state to alleviate the stress on hospitals. This helped people who were ready to move out of the hospital to other facilities and freed up hospital capacity for those who need it. There is still a need for additional subacute beds and we're working with more long-term care and rehabilitation facilities to bring an additional 47 beds online over the next two weeks and possibly more to follow as they are needed. We're also meeting with the VA Medical Center in White River Junction to discuss extending the agreement which allows them to serve civilians. Up to 10 mental health beds have been available to serve civilians as capacity at the VA Center allows. As I mentioned last week, we're also working with hospitals to open 10 additional ICU beds. I'd like to thank our hospitals for their efforts to look at ways to improve the ability for patients to move through the healthcare system as well as to increase capacity. We are supporting their efforts by providing financial assistance to help staff additional ICU beds at Central Vermont Medical Center, Northwestern Medical Center, and Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Now let's turn to testing. Vermont tests more than any other state on a per capita basis. We lead the nation in testing and have maintained throughout the pandemic a robust testing system. As you can see on the slide, as the governor had mentioned, over the last seven days, 69,072 tests were performed for a daily average of 9,867 tests. On average, we provide Vermonters with 32 testing sites per week, and many of them offer testing on multiple days. During this holiday season, we are increasing the number of COVID testing sites, and we will continue to review the data on a regular basis to determine where more testing capacity may be needed. You may have already gotten your COVID tests to prepare for the Thanksgiving holidays, but if you haven't, it's not too late. Here's some information that may help. 
Just yesterday, we added more than 1,700 additional testing appointments at various locations throughout the state. We will offer COVID testing. We will offer COVID tests this Wednesday through state testing sites or at local hospitals. If you get tested on Wednesday, our goal is to get your results before Thanksgiving. In addition to Wednesday testing, we have test targeted specific areas where sites were already full, including adding more than 400 testing appointments in Chittenden County and 200 self-serve walk-in appointments in Rutland. We will continue to monitor and add, add testing where necessary. Holiday testing has given us a perfect opportunity to incorporate advancements in testing technology. Adding additional types of testing technology will make testing more accessible and get results faster. For example, for many of the testing sites on Wednesday, we are using LAMP tests at locations throughout the state. LAMP tests offer the same accuracy as PCR tests, but have a quicker turnaround uh, time. As I mentioned last week, this transition in our testing strategy is ongoing. And when a reliable supply chain develops, you will see us moving to testing platforms that have more rapid turnaround capability. In addition, you may see that some testing sites are piloting self-service tests when they exceed their normal number of appointments. More than 1,500 self-service kits have been distributed to 10 testing sites to be used over the next two weeks. We also encourage Vermonters to use rapid at-home antigen tests, which are available at local pharmacies or online. We are confident that with careful monitoring and by adopting new testing options, Vermonters will be able to get a test this holiday season so they can gather safely with their family and friends. Also, if you're looking for a test this week, remember to check out your local pharmacy or hospital. Many hospitals now consistently offer testing, including Copley in Morrisville, Gifford in Randolph, and SVMC in Bennington. Please make an appointment by get, to get tested by contacting the hospital directly. You can also go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 slash testing to find their contact information or to register for a test at one of the state's sites. Again, please make sure you get vaccinated, vaccinated, get your booster if eligible, and plan to get tested before Thanksgiving if you're gathering with others. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. I likewise am going to start off today with boosters. As you know, Vermont expanded booster eligibility last week to everyone 18 and over who met the time requirements, two or more months after the J&J &J shot or six or more months since your second shot of Moderna or Pfizer. This was done to make it as easy as possible to get boosted without any barriers. The FDA and CDC followed suit late last week. And I'm glad to reaffirm that the data shows booster shots are working. Vermont has the highest uptake of booster shots among those 65 and older. When we look at our case rates, that population now represents a smaller percentage of cases, only 10 to 12% on a given day. Remember, this older population is higher risk, so we are protecting those who most need it. And this is in turn also protecting the capacity of our healthcare system to be able to serve us all without having to cope with overwhelming numbers of patients with COVID. Now, the need for a booster does not mean the COVID-19 vaccines have failed to do their job. Do not let anyone try to convince you of that. They are highly protective 
against the worst effects of COVID. But the protection we get from a vaccine can start to wear off over time. Booster shots are incredibly common for many vaccines and can increase our protection against those viruses. Indeed, a number of vaccines through the ages have consisted of a three-dose initial series. For COVID-19, booster shots are especially important for those at higher risk who got vaccinated early on. Like the majority of Vermonters who fall into this category and were vaccinated very early in this year. And at a time when COVID transmission is high, when we're indoors more and getting together over the holidays, boosters really do benefit us all. The shots are free, safe, and widely available. So if it's time for your booster, get the most protection possible against COVID-19 and make your appointment today. Visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. We're also excited that nearly 40% of kids age 5 to 11 in Vermont have had or are signed up for their vaccine. I hope that parents and caregivers who have not yet made an appointment see the experience of others who are embracing the vaccine to give kids more freedom and keep them healthy. And the vaccine allows them to interact safely with those older adults in their lives something so many of us have sorely missed over the past two years and which may be occurring in the next couple of days. Being vaccinated also improves the safety and functioning of these children's schools and communities as an extra benefit. I encourage you to take time to get any questions answered so you can feel ready to get your own child vaccinated. You can join a Zoom conversation with Vermont pediatricians from your region. To learn more, visit aapvermont.org. To make a vaccine appointment, visit healthvermont.gov slash kidsvaccine. You all know Thanksgiving is on Thursday, and I certainly want to add my wishes to all Vermonters to have a happy and healthy holiday. Enjoy your time celebrating with others again this year while taking precautions to protect friends and loved ones around your dinner table. Remember, the smaller and more vaccinated your gathering is, the safer it is. Pretty simple and straightforward advice. And if you have access to the at-home antigen tests, those can also provide some extra reassurance around your gathering. It's a good idea to schedule a test afterward as well, about five to seven days later. If people at higher risk are coming to your Thanksgiving table, consider wearing a mask when you're not eating to lower the risk of transmission. And most importantly, as always, if you feel sick, even with mild symptoms, please stay home. I know how difficult it can be to change plans and miss out on festivities, but with the high levels of COVID in our communities right now, this means you could possibly have a chance that you have the virus. And getting your friends or family sick and maybe seriously ill is just not worth the risk. Now this guidance is not only for Thanksgiving. I encourage everyone to keep it in mind as the holiday season continues. If you're considering planning or attending any holiday, social, or workplace gathering or other event, the more vaccination and testing you insist upon and do, the better. The smaller the group, the lower the risk. If you're getting a group together, consider finding a bigger space to allow people to spread out and encourage people to wear masks where appropriate and employers should take similar steps to ensure the safety of their staff, especially those who will be in close contact with the public. Unfortunately, as the governor said, we do expect to see more cases after Thanksgiving. So the more we can plan ahead for keeping the holidays safe, the healthier we will all be. My final note is on the flu, speaking of steps to stay healthy. 
we're already seeing cases of flu in Vermont. Not a lot, but we've already seen some. So it seems that unlike last year, we will have a flu season. We are well behind last year's record-setting uptake of flu vaccinations. So if you haven't already, get your flu shot. This year is actually similar to 2019 with about 193,000 shots by this date. Just to compare, last year at this time, there were 255,000 doses administered. The largest gap seems to be in those ages 18 to 64. Getting a flu shot will help you avoid having to miss school, work, or your favorite winter activities. You can even get the shot when you get a COVID vaccine if you want. Please do this as soon as possible. The very last thing our healthcare system needs is a surge of flu on top of COVID. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Now open it up to questions. It's an interesting question. I, I asked the same one not long ago um, because I kept uh, wondering how much wood is left to fuel this fire. And uh, the answer was uh, higher than I expected uh, because there are still a number of people uh, unvaccinated at this point in time. So upwards to 100,000 maybe unvaccinated, maybe a little less. Um, that might be a Mike, uh, Commissioner Pichak question. Uh, and there are some of those uh, who have not been infected as of yet. Uh, so I would say somewhere around 50,000, but Dr. Levine might have that number. Just, just keep in mind, we've probably had in the 40 to 50,000 range of people who have been infected throughout the whole pandemic. Then we have this huge number, half a million people who have been vaccinated and many of them never had an infection that they were aware of. We, we have 50,000 unvaccinated adults, and we have whatever percentage of the 44,000, 60% of the 44,000 kids that uh, are not yet vaccinated, and then a smaller group of kids under age five. So there still is, as the governor kind of alluded to, uh, plenty of uh, fresh uninfected people who have never been vaccinated that this virus can still find. And it is very adept at finding them. We know that for a fact. But the reality is, even if we think about 40 to 50,000 people in Vermont having been infected, that's not a high percentage of the state, um, very low. And we think before Delta, it was three or 4% of the state had actually had an infection. So vaccination is protecting a heck of a lot of people uh, from that. Uh, probably a question <clears throat> for Dr. Levine. You, you mentioned lamp tests. Um, I'd imagine some people might be questioning what, what those are, how they work, and how that's different than an antigen test, but also having the same accuracy as a PCR test. Yes, great question. So there's this category of tests called NAAT, nucleic acid amplification tests. The PCR is the one we all recognize, and that's the one we've used to rely on throughout the pandemic. Turns out, though, there are several other uh, more progressive now technologies that include LAMP, that still go under the rubric of nucleic acid amplification tests. So they share the same sensitivity and accuracy for diagnosis. Uh, and uh, if you will, they can be a substitute for the PCR, which is our gold standard test. So these are not antigen tests. These are nucleic acid amplification tests. And so the LAMP is another variety. And the thing that differentiates it for the purpose we've been talking is you can get the result back the same day. 
Now, there are PCR tests that several of our hospitals can get results back on the same day with special uh, equipment that, that will do that, but the lamp uh, can do that in a very user-friendly way. So um, if you want to know what the LAMP stands for, it's Loop Mediated Isothermal Amplification. But it's, again, same nasal swab, um, nothing different in what you do to get the test. It's just a difference in uh, the ability of us to get a quicker result. These are not widely available. And as the Secretary alluded to, these are tests that, uh, if the supply chain were different, perhaps every state in the country would just convert to doing them, uh, especially if the cost uh, came down as well. But at this point in time, they're not part of a great supply chain. You know, I, I don't have my eye on that completely. Do you have any data? I, I would hope not because, you know, when side effects occur, we're talking 24 hours, 48 hours. So um, I'm sure most people wouldn't want to do it the day before Thanksgiving. You know, that's probably a rational thought. Uh, but other than that, have you seen any data? Here's our role model for the state. Um, you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if Wednesday we saw a reduction. What would you advise? Go, go for it if you have a one-year plan. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again, most people are not totally debilitated by side effects. And we're finding that the third dose, the so-called booster dose, does not have any increase in frequency of any side effects compared to the primary series. So the real concern is people getting that booster dose in a timely way. And if timely is the day before Thanksgiving, I wouldn't discourage that. Will testing capacity uh, be consistent through this week and Friday, Saturday, Saturday? Yeah, the, the only day that we won't be testing is going to be Thursday. Um, we will be testing on Wednesday. We will be testing on uh, on Friday. Like I said, we are we are looking at this technology, this lamp technology, on Wednesday and using that as a uh, as a, sort of a test run on Wednesday on the the lamp technology. So, um, you know, everything will sort of return to normal on Friday, starting on Friday again. Well, hard to say. Um, again, I think you have to look at uh, our team of experts. We've been at this for 20 months now. Uh, I think that we've we've led Vermont well, and I think that there are many others, uh, the White House in particular, that looks at us as being a gold standard. I don't think the legislature has as many of those experts advising them as I do. Um, but I'm very confident in my team and the approach we've taken and we'll continue uh, to do what we think is best for Vermont. Having said that, I understand uh, that they feel overwhelmed when they hear from constituents, um, particularly a very vocal number of constituents. But from my standpoint, when you look at the broad approach, broadly over Vermont, I think they'd see what I see, uh, is that there is a resistance uh, to mandates, and I think it's counterproductive. I, you know, I wanted to, to mention this as well, which gives me an opportunity, but Reuters had an article today, maybe you've seen it, but the headline is, No More COVID Lockdowns in U.S. 
White House says. And this is by Jeff Zients, who speaks for the White House. He's the coordinator for the pandemic. And this was in, in regards to um, imposing a lockdown or shutdown of the economy or anything else uh, that, uh, other than what we're doing today. And then here's what he said. Now, Jeff Zients, speaking for the White House, full support of the president, said, we are not headed in that direction. We have the tools to accelerate the path out of this pandemic. Widely available vaccinations, booster shots, kids shots, therapeutics. We can curb the spread of the virus without having to do uh, to in any way shut down our economy. And this is what the White House press secretary said in the same article. The U.S. health officials are not currently recommending lockdowns or economic restrictions to curb rising COVID-19 cases. It appears to me the White House feels has the same approach that we do. And, uh, and we've seen some success. So it's just a difference of opinion. Um, and again, I am confident with our, um, our experts, our team, and the approach we're taking. But that doesn't mean that they won't attempt to do something in January. And so just to follow up, I mean, it, in hearing from in my discussions with lawmakers, nobody's calling for economic shutdowns or lockdowns. They've been calling for, for localized. So, so I'd have to ask you then, um, Calvin, when you ask them uh, the follow-up question to what did they mean when they, in their resolution, it said, an emergency, they wanted a state of emergency, correct? Okay, state of emergency, they wanted mass mandates, correct? And all other measures to curb this, all other measures. What did they mean by all other measures other than what we've done over the last 20 months, which has been reducing the size of gatherings, <coughs> closing businesses, and so forth. So I don't know what else they mean other than that, but maybe maybe you've asked them that. And I'd be curious what their answer was. Governor, you supported uh, Senator Leahy in the re-election. Do you support Peter Welch's uh, campaign for the Senate? And if not, why not? Well, uh, I've worked with um, Congressman Welch, when he was in the Senate, as you know, we served in the Senate together. I have a great deal of respect for him, but we have a, a long ways to go um, before the election. Um, I would expect there will be a number of other candidates stepping up for this possibly once-in-a-lifetime opportunity after 46 years. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see um, I know there'll be a Republican candidate. I don't know who that's going to be or number of Republican candidates. Um, I don't, I would expect that we might see more Democrats uh, as well stepping up. We might even see an independent, um, maybe a moderate centrist uh, business person, who knows? So I think it's a little early um, to uh, talk about whether I support someone or not, but I've had a good relationship with Congressman Welch, and we'll uh, we'll see what happens. Are you uh, helping to recruit or talking with anybody or encourage? I have not at this point, no. Um, yeah, I think the antigen tests are a good method at this point, um, but not as effective uh, and accurate as PCR tests, but certainly the turnaround time is much quicker. And I think it's the wave of the future. Well, we talked about this a uh, bit with the White House. I think they're on the same page. Uh, our concern right now is we need more of them. Uh, and hearing other governors on the call this morning, uh, particularly from the Northeast, we're all suffering from that. Governor, Governor Mills from Maine, Governor Baker, uh, amongst others, uh, have said 
we could use more of the inventory. Uh, the White House believes it's geographic. There isn't a need in some other parts of the country that we're seeing here. Uh, they also said that there are now, uh, Abbott was, uh, was the early um, manufacturer of these uh, antigen tests. And uh, now there are uh, 13 manufacturers. And so the production will increase. They said that they would help us out in obtaining more. My concern is, you know, they're still off the shelf. They're $15, $20. So um, we want to make sure that they're widely available and that we can get them so that we can uh, disperse the supply because it's any test is good, you know, and we're certainly uh, doing more testing as has been reported by many today, uh, doing more testing than any other state. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Reed? Just a quick word about how, how to use these appropriately uh, because you're talking antigen tests, correct? <laughs> so usually they come in a two pack and there's a good reason for that. Um, while doing one and never doing another one is probably better than nothing, um, it's not a great strategy. They're not as sensitive as the PCR test that we've talked about before. So we've recommended, especially for Thanksgiving, you do one either today or tomorrow, and then do the second one on the holiday. That will increase the sensitivity and uh, give you greater reassurance if it's truly negative on both occasions. Um, are you talking locally or nationally? <laughs> um, because it probably will happen on both, uh, uh, on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a bit concerned. There's so many. Uh, we'll, we'll learn more uh, about who's going to run uh, out of the legislature, for instance. But uh, it does. There's a lot of political posturing that happens along the way. And that could uh, hurt our ability to do the things we need to do. We're in a position right now with uh, receiving so, so much federal money uh, that we need to act as quickly and as efficiently and effectively as possible. So uh, I think we need to put politics aside, put the campaign aside, regardless of what position you're uh, vying for, and uh, try and just do what's right. I mean, here, here we are. We, we took one day yesterday. We passed one bill one day uh, through both chambers. Um, so when I do the math on that, um, and we passed 82 bills uh, in the last session, we should be able to get through this in 90 days, uh, which is something that I've been talking about for a number of years. So hopefully uh, that's the benchmark. And then they can go to campaigning after that. If we can adjourn the session, they can go on to campaigning across the state. Uh, I would think that that would be an incentive to raise money and to uh, to get out there. All right, we'll move to the phones, beginning with Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, the special legislative session yesterday apparently was sparked in part by claims on behalf of leaders of towns and cities wanting mandatory masks. and. Some legislators said the Vermont League of Cities and Towns pushed on that claim that their members wanted it. And I know you mentioned the league was today in your opening remark that the league was sort of behind it. Yet the legislators say they since learned that there never was any poll by the VLCT of its members that, that there was no survey. Uh, apparently it was a wish of a few members out of their 246 cities and towns throughout the state. Plus, I think they also have some villages and water districts, but there was no survey. And some legislators were missed at being misled. I know Senator Dayton was among those that was vocal about the misrepresentation. And as Dean of the Senate, he flipped his vote. He was going to vote for the local mandate, but in the end changed his vote. Uh, I'm just wondering, what was your understanding from the league as to 
Curly, how many towns and cities were screaming for this and what steps they had taken or wanted to take for a local a local mask uh, mandate? Uh, all, all this because maybe a half dozen towns wanted it. Yeah, to be honest, uh, Mike, I never we never asked them how many towns supported it. We just assume, uh, but because they they represent all 251 uh, towns uh, and villages uh, that they had pulled their members. Um, I was a bit surprised at the number of uh, towns that pushed back and said that they did not want this um, through the legislator uh, legislators. Um, but you know, I saw it on TV. I saw the. Um, I think it was Karen Horn on uh, on one interview that said that they wanted this, uh, and that sparked my interest and thought that's when I began to think that maybe this was the compromise uh, that we needed to get through uh, into the next session, and uh, and then we also received uh, a letter from the LCT as well asking for this. So. I just assumed uh, that uh, that their membership wanted this, but that's probably a better question for them. Okay, and I'm, I may have missed it, but uh, what is the latest numbers as to on this latest uptick uh, on positive tests? Of is there any numbers, or what are the numbers as to how many of those people weren't vaccinated, did not get their shots? I mean, what percent? It's, it's usually around 70 percent um, that are unvaccinated. And it, and it hovers. It sometimes it's 65, sometimes it's 75, but it, it averages out around 70. Of those that were recently tested positive? Correct. Didn't, never got the shots? Correct. It's the same with the hospitalizations, about the same, same rate. Although, again, as I've said before, if you do the math, you take the number of people who have been vaccinated who are now uh, infected versus the number, low number of people in some respects as compared, you know, if there's 50,000 that are unvaccinated versus the 500,000 that are, uh, and, uh, the, and they have three times uh, the number of uh, people. Uh, that are infected uh, on a daily basis or test positive, um, the percentage is much higher. So, I mean, okay. you think about that, it's like 10, 11 times um, uh, more likely. If you're unvaccinated, it's 10, 11 times more likely you'll end up either in the hospital or uh, infected. Sure. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Hope Thanks. you have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, I heard you guys today talking about rapid testing and the White House is seeking more. What's actually going to happen when there are more rapid tests available? How will people access them? Can you clarify what Secretary Smith said about take-home tests being available for Thanksgiving? Will there be regular access for the public to free rapid tests? Yeah, we're, we're hoping so, but there are some on the shelves. but. Again, I think it's in short supply right now in the Northeast for whatever reason. Um, but, uh, but again, on the call with the White House today, it, it appears it's geographic. Many areas of the, in the country don't have that problem, but they said that they would help us out in that regard. I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer the rest. Lisa, just to avoid any confusion, um, testing is rapidly becoming um, many sort of different tests. Um, as, uh, as Commissioner Levine talked about, as Dr. Levine talked about, we are test driving LAMP tests, which are PCR-like tests, um, but have a fairly uh, significant short, short turnaround um, this week on Wednesday at uh, multiple testing sites across the state. The take-home tests are PCR tests. Um, you basically, what you do is you, you get a, a test kit, you swab yourself, you put your swab into a vial, and then that vial is collected and sent to a lab, so it's, it's a self-administered test. 
the antigen tests as they come in, um, I think we'll start seeing them at the various sites uh, across the state. As you remember, I talked about last week that we're progressing our, we're really evolving our testing capabilities to be faster um, with faster results uh, as we move with the different technologies that are evolving as well. We, we see a lot of pro promise with lamp tests, um, with antigen tests as well, and we'll try to introduce those. As soon as there's a supply chain that's reliable, we don't really have a supply chain that's reliable. The governor has mentioned that the White House wants to help out on that, and that's something that we're very, um, very thankful for, is that supply chain firming up so that we can move in the direction that we want to move into these rapid tests, whether it's a lamp test or an antigen test. Thank you. And while you're at the podium, um, any progress or updates on a Mad River Valley sugar bush Warren Waitfield sure. um, facility as we move into winter? Yeah, I talked to uh, various people within the agency, and we're, we would be excited to add a testing uh, uh, opportunity into that area. It, we're going to look at it right after Thanksgiving, Lisa. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much. Hey, Governor, I, I just bought an antigen test, and it's the first uh, COVID-related thing I had to buy, and it wasn't cheap. It was $25. Um, is there a, a thought of bringing that into the, um, you know, the state's been picking up, the federal government to get up all the, the COVID-related costs, and that, you know, $25 would be significant to get to do it several times. Any, any thought about um, how the, how the cost could be rolled into that for the antigen? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we a number of governors this morning had spoken about that and, uh, and the costs associated with that. And we, we're looking at all um, different options, uh, but we need the inventory first. I think the more the capacity is built, uh, the, the more inventory there'll be, the, the less expensive it'll be as well. So um, there'll be many, many different options available, uh, whether it's the this PCR, PCI, um, PCR like uh, lamp test. Uh, that uh, that would be the most accurate uh, and uh, give us uh, the uh, results uh, much quicker. Uh, but the energy tests are, are viable as well, and they're getting better as time moves on. So this is the future, and uh, we're going to have to figure out how we do this. Uh, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to, the federal government is going to be able to pay for every test uh, for, uh, in, an, in eternity, uh, but, but we'll see uh, as they... Um, the, ch the change in technology, the advancement in, in uh, different testing procedures, where this lands, uh, it's going to be lucrative for someone uh, to, uh, to come up with new ways to have an instant test that's accurate. So, again, I don't have any answers for you, but we are looking at this from the National Governance Association standpoint and trying to work with the White House. Okay, as far as the local mask mandate, are you concerned at all, you're, you know, we're entering a very important economic season for the state, that it could um, in some way crimp uh, economic activity at all? I, I don't see that as a problem. Um, we went through this again before uh, we gave this option uh, a year ago uh, to municipalities. And there were probably uh, a dozen or so, maybe more, uh, who took advantage of that. And I'm, you know, just anecdotally, uh, I don't. I just don't see that it's going to be widespread. You may see a number of the larger communities uh, taking advantage of this, but um, I, I don't see that it would prevent uh, anything, any economic loss as a result. It's just a, it's a mass it's a mass mandate, right? We're not. There's yeah. nothing else they can do. Yeah, and just to be crystal crystal clear, you've been adamant about not running for U.S. Senate, but um, about the uh, the open congressional same, seat, same, now, which is a same answer. Same, answer, same answer, same answer. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. It's still going to the same place, right? 
Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, you said in your opening remarks that you were thankful for all the Vermonters that have stepped up and done their part um, uh, to, to help put us in the position we're in. I'm wondering, though, uh, how much of this Delta surge could have been avoided, and do you have uh, any frustration or disappointment that um, you know vaccination rates weren't higher and, and we might have been in an even better spot? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, and uh, I think it's very unfortunate uh, that this turned political early on, and I think that that started the hesitancy. Uh, not that we wouldn't have seen some hesitancy uh, to uh, vaccines uh, and uh, trying to do the right thing, but, um, but it turned political early on, and uh, it's been a constant challenge. We've we have been fortunate here in Vermont. Again, Vermonters have risen above that and done the right thing for the most part. Um, so I'm thankful for that. Again, we're leading in a number of different categories, but as a nation, uh, I think this continues to plague us. Uh, and, and, and that is a result of just this being turned into a, uh, a political tool uh, in the early stages. And, and that's just been unfortunate because we could have gotten through this a lot quicker. And any concern about uh, what's happening in Europe these days with rising cases and uh, new lockdowns and mandates? Yeah, uh, and, and we're seeing this uh, more and more. Austria, uh, for instance, uh, I think they've, they've uh, enacted a stay home, stay safe for those who are unvaccinated. Um, Brussels, Germany, uh, those are the hot spots right now. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Senator Rom was uh, Rom Hinsdale was there last week, and uh, that's a hot spot. So yeah, it's concerning what we're seeing in Europe. And uh, uh, one local question then for Secretary Smith: um, the cases we've seen the last few weeks in prisons uh, with the declared outbreaks in Saint Jay and Newport. How would you characterize these cases? Um, are they a reflection of Delta's transmissibility and just the presence of the virus in the community? Or are they pointing to signs of, of something that's problematic, um, uh, whether it be the effectiveness of vaccines or, or protocols in prisons that maybe need to be modified? I, I, yeah, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer this, but uh, I will note uh, that the those in the North uh, northeast, northwest, uh, and uh, I think Rutland as well have the a lower vaccination rate of uh, of the offenders of any of the correctional facilities across the state. So that that doesn't help, and uh, probably as well, uh, we, I'm not sure about the numbers in terms of the boosters in in the correctional facilities, but uh, we're trying to get people boosted as well. I think to answer your question directly, I think it, it really does reflect, you know, the virus comes into the facilities. The facilities have been doing a great job, probably the best in the country in, in trying to curb um, the transmission within the facilities, but it does enter through the facilities and it does enter, um, you know, at, um, at locations where there's high sort of trans, uh, where there's high infection rates of uh, Orleans with Northern, obviously um, has been a, a particular one that we've been looking at. I, I think, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that vaccines have done for us is to contain the spread. Um, you know, earlier we would see, you know, an infection rate, then we'd have 180 that would be affected right away. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing pockets of infection, but we're seeing really um, a containment of that infection as we move forward. We still do the isolation techniques. We still do the, the separation techniques that we've always used, and they seem to have a good impact on it. In terms of boosters, you, you got to remember most of our population is younger, so their boosters are in accordance with the CDC guidelines six months after Pfizer and, um, and Moderna and two months after J&J. &J. I spoke with the commissioner um, on Monday 
saying we need to uh, look at the boosters, and he has assured me that we're going to be boostering um, that those facilities as soon as the uh, inmates are eligible, and I expect that to happen within the next few days, a uh, few weeks, in terms of trying to get anybody that's eligible uh, boosted in the uh, in those facilities. Okay, thank you very much. Am I muted, Jason? Can you hear me? Gotcha. Well, uh, Governor, Secretary Smith referenced the uh, thousand people plus staff and five to eleven year olds who've been, uh, by the receipt of the vaccine or have been registered for the vaccine. The vast majority of those kids were signed up in the first week, and uh, registration update and volume has slowed pretty dramatically since then. And I'm wondering how far you are at this point that. Vaccination rates in that age group are going to be what you would hope they would be come February, March. Yeah, well, again, um, this is an unexpected. Uh, although we lead the, the nation in the number of 5 to 11 year olds uh, receiving vaccinations, uh, we knew that this was going to be a, a difficult uh, category. Uh, and I think that the pediatricians have stepped up. They're trying to. Um, counsel parents to do what they feel is right uh, but it's a tremendous responsibility being a parent and deciding for your kids what what is best for them so um, I think some are just taking a little bit of time uh, wanting to see you know those early uh, in the early stages uh, a number of people uh, a number of kids have received their vaccinations and I think I think we'll see uh, that they uh, uh, give them more comfort after they see the results of that over a couple, two, three weeks, and we'll see more uh, gradually uh, receiving vaccinations as a result. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's we want to get that category as we've seen, as uh, Commissioner Pichak had shown on a graph. Uh, that's where we see the highest level of infection at this point in time. Um, so it's uh, incumbent upon us to try and get them vaccinated. Dr. Levine, anything you want to add to that? Just to reiterate that it is a big decision for parents to make. So we had a third of the country surveyed said they would go right away to get the vaccine for their kids. We've already exceeded that in Vermont, so that's wonderful. Um, but there is that middle group that wants to wait a little bit longer and survey things and make sure that uh, the safety is what it was touted to be and all of that. So on the one hand, I get it completely. But on the other hand, every day I look at our reports of our cases and 20, sometimes more than 20% of our cases every day of the week are in that age group, below 12 years of age. So, um, I just hate for those parents to wait so long that their kid ended up becoming one of those cases um, and then had all the disruptions in their life that being a case you know, leads to. So again, the pediatricians are really doing a great job. If you missed their forum in your region of the state, they're all on the AAP website so you can watch it uh, at your leisure. And um, I'm sure that the questions you have as a parent are answered there because so many parents have so many of the same questions. So just uh, keep that in mind and uh, watch uh, the video of what went on during the town forum to get a real good acquaintance with how effective and safe the vaccine is in this age group and how well the concerns that parents uh, we know have uh, can be responded to. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Aaron Patanko, Vermont Digger. Hi. Um, the Department of Health recently put out new action levels for PCB um, testing in schools. I was wondering um, if Dr. Levine could comment on what went into that decision and um, what that kind of means for schools going forward, particularly Burlington High School, which 
we've seen has action levels well beyond that 100 nanograms per milligram or something limit. Sure. I wouldn't use the word new action levels. These are newly created action levels. This is an entire legislatively determined program of testing schools and keeping kids safe that is just being unveiled. I know the situation has been very challenging for all concerned, especially the Burlington school community. And obviously what happened in Burlington was made especially hard because we were in the middle of a pandemic as well. But whether it's COVID, whether it involves lead, whether it involves PCBs, our interests are first and foremost in the health and safety of our children and the teachers and the staff who work in our schools. And our goal throughout the process is to work with school districts and communities to find the best and most safe way for our children to have their best school experience possible, which they all deserve. The memorandum that we put on our website really lays out the PCB action levels and the contributing science behind them. And they're part of a larger Department of Health and Department of Environmental Conservation action to really develop state policies to support schools in achieving the lowest level of PCBs in their buildings as possible. And this material that we put out was really the foundation for the regulatory framework that is just being developed per the legislation and the testing requirements that were established to go along with it. Remember that PCBs are a chemical of concern with both state and federal regulatory responsibility. So the state action levels are for the air in the school. Burlington wasn't part of a comprehensive testing policy. At the time, they were considering doing construction work, and so they had their building materials tested. And those are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. So if Burlington wants to consider using their existing buildings, which are all known to contain PCB materials in them, they obviously have more work to do with the EPA and to gather more data to understand what their options might be. I want to make sure that everyone understands that there are screening levels, which just are what the testing program will all produce, and that those screening levels are to enable us to know where there may be a problem. The action levels were used and developed using science and data by some of our most experienced colleagues at the health department and around the country. And let me be clear, I stand by their work and um, believe that uh, it is quite valuable and will in the end prove to be quite protective for our youth. I, uh, I also have a question about the Department of Health data summary that comes out um, every other week. Um, I, uh, I saw this week that it has now been kind of carried back. you know, demographics of new cases and other factors that used to be tracked through contact tracing. Um, is some of that data being collected by the department, but just no longer being released to something else that I'm not clear about? Yeah, so to be clear, most of what was in the data summary will still be available. There are um, clearly outbreaks being followed because we talk about them frequently. And so that data is still available. The case-by-case -case data, <clears throat> which has been in aggregate since the very beginning of the pandemic, much of that requires 
some of the results of what occurs in those phone calls that the contact tracers do. So at a time when we couldn't add to that data because of the reduction in the direct contact tracing, uh, we didn't want to publish anything new in those areas that would have been impacted by that. So it's really uh, a small proportion, actually. And even in the current caseloads, the amount of data that would have come in that would have markedly changed any of the data that you were used to looking at uh, was probably not going to be very impactful. Uh, but the data that you need to go forward is still going to be there on an every other week basis. We got most of that, I believe. Here, I think the question is the staff, what the percentage of staff is, uh, and then maybe the percentage of uh, of inmates as well. Do you have that number, Secretary? Yeah. What is the uh, vaccination rate for the staff that's awarded from our correctional facility? Yeah, I'll, we have that information. I, I just don't have it right here in front of me, but we do have that information. I'll get it. I'll get it to you by the end of today. Okay, perfect. Is that the only question I have? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Greg Lamro, the county carrier. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, starting in just a couple weeks, uh, Vermont's going to have winter sports in high schools. Uh, I know you're leaving a lot of the rules up to high schools and, and uh, supervisory unions, but I'm wondering if if you think that um, those who want to attend should have to uh, show proof of vaccine. Uh, you know, after all, it, it may be protecting the student athletes. It, it may even be a, a way to encourage some people to get vaccinated. I'm, I'm wondering what your take is on that. Yeah, obviously, I think uh, being vaccinated, having your boosters is the best approach uh, to getting through this. Uh, having said that, uh, we are we don't have a state of emergency. Don't think we need one. Uh, and that would be the only means of us uh, exerting our authority. All we can do is provide guidelines. Uh, I don't know if Secretary Moore is on today. I am okay, and maybe you could just uh, clarify what our guidance is to the uh, um, BPA on this. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we have been recommending masking for athletes, but also for uh, officials and spectators at all indoor winter sports events this year. Um, we've also made those same recommendations to recreational sports leagues, recognizing youth athletes um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering is I know you can't order it you can't request it but would would you like to see schools do that you can ask that that schools require such a thing and and uh, at the uh, north south football game uh, all media was required to be vaccinated in order to attend and I just wondered if that's something you would like to see happen yeah, I think, again, I think it's a, it's good uh, for people to do that. I think it is the, the path forward, especially indoors. Uh, I have heard, in fact, uh, I heard the Associated General Contractors having their annual meeting this year, and they're requiring anyone attending uh, to, have, uh, to be vaccinated, which I thought was uh, interesting, and I applaud their effort. But this is really a decision that they need to make locally. And, uh, and again, um, we have given a path forward for our state employees uh, that I think is, uh, is reasonable. Uh, we believe that they should be vaccinated, but there is a, an exit ramp, so to speak, and that is uh, testing and uh, uh, regular testing and masking. So 
again, that's the path we've taken. We haven't made it mandatory. Okay. And uh, lastly, Governor, uh, as you know, longtime state rep Ryan Savage announced his resignation yesterday on the House floor. I'm told he, I, I'm, I've been told that he notified your office prior to that. I'm, I'm wondering how the search for a replacement is going and if you wanted to comment a little bit on Brian's departure. Yeah, uh, Brian, uh, I've served with Brian. Uh, he did a lot of work for his community. Uh, sorry to see him go, um, but uh, but I think that he has uh, another opportunity ahead of him. Uh, in terms of uh, a replacement, uh, that will be forwarded from, we'll request uh, the local Republican organization uh, to uh, forward three names to us for our consideration to replace, uh, replace Brian. That's the way it normally works, whatever. Uh, whatever political affiliation uh, that member was, we we will uh, will ask for that uh, organization, local organization, to send us three names uh, for us to consider. Okay, thank you, Governor. Happy uh, Thanksgiving. You too. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. We can. Okay. I actually have a question for Dr. Levine. Um, another follow-up question about the guidance regarding CCB levels in schools. Um, just a, another follow-up for you, uh, Dr. Levine. When did that? When did the state's review of these new standards begin, or you know, the action level begin? And when did the health department realize that this guidance might be changed? It's been going on for many months. I can't give you an exact date of when it began. Um, probably began when the legislation was passed, to be honest, but in earnest, certainly over the last several months. And what was the second part of your question? Uh, when the health department realized that, that the guidance would be changed. Okay, so again, I have to be very clear that right now, We obviously provide guidance regarding health protective levels, and there is now a regulatory process in place uh, that the Agency of Natural Resources through the Department of Environmental Conservation provides, but that was not the case prior to the legislation. So all we had was what the screening levels were if they were detected in air uh, at any location. So we actually have been working in earnest work with the Department of Environmental Conservation um, to create the entire framework that has been called for. So it's not as if we changed a lot of things. Uh, we've evolved to be able to provide what's needed for this regulatory process. Okay. And I guess, I guess another follow-up would be just... I, I, might, I, might also add, I might also add that I believe we're the only state in the country that has this program for testing of schools. So we're uh, certainly leading the curve in this, uh, in this arena and have been working with experts around the country and have worked with our colleagues in the Agency of Natural Resources and uh, with the EPA as well um, because a lot of this is breaking new ground and making sure that we do the most for safety with something that is contaminating our environment very pervasively in every, every part of our environment and where you can, if you test, detect PCBs uh, consistently across. So we have to be able to set levels that take into account what I would call this background level of uh, PCBs in the environment that we're all unfortunately subject to uh, because of uh, what's happened to the environment. Right, okay, 
Okay, and so during this months-long review that the state was doing, at any time did the state kind of reach out to Burlington knowing that they were dealing with this problem, that the guidelines, you know, that this review was happening, that the numbers could shift? Is there anything the state could have done to kind of give Burlington a heads up that this might occur, which could then maybe have prevented them from spending millions of dollars to retrofit a department store for high school and, you know, give up their plans to spend $70 million on renovating a school and build a new one? Like, they've kind of gone down this path. Is there anything the state could have done to kind of head that off or give them any guidance along the way? Actually, the state, I won't use the word the state, but the Department of Health has worked with Burlington very consistently for many, many, many months. And our teams continue to meet with them, with their consultants, with the EPA, regarding the situation. And the implication of your question is that the action level set would have changed the whole equation for what's going on in Burlington, and I would just have to dispute that. They have a number of buildings on the campus that all have levels of contamination that they are dealing with EPA and others with and made their own decisions on. Our publication is only regarding the screening and action levels for health that are protective for health. So I wouldn't want the thesis to be that what we did all of a sudden should make Burlington change everything they did and they wasted millions of dollars and caused lots of distress to kids who couldn't be in their school because that's actually not an accurate reflection of the process. Okay, so I know that there are parents that have brought up those exact concerns. What would you say in response to that? Well, I would have them continue to engage with their school community and have a great understanding of exactly why decisions were made, on what basis, all of the input that they've gotten from various consultants in the environmental arena and in the EPA so that they can get a complete story because I do think it's being misportrayed at this point in time. Are there any other misconceptions that you want to clear up now? No. Again, I said before, our experts have used science and data to develop these protective levels and their expertise is really unquestioned. Okay, thank you. Chris Mays, Brattleboro Reformer. Good afternoon. I was just, at this point with Vermont leading in vaccination metrics with the CDC, I was just wondering what you think the strategies that have been most effective for your administration in getting people vaccinated? Well, again, it has to, you know, I go back to the people of Vermont and their willingness to accept the vaccine and some of the guidelines and advice that we're giving them. Without their willingness, we wouldn't be able to be as successful as we've been. But, you know, I believe having a team of experts and communicating with Vermonters on a daily basis, certainly on a weekly basis, sometimes two to three times a week in this setting, has been advantageous. Trying to give them the honest news, you know, both good and bad, and trying to reason with people has been helpful. But, again, I go back to it's the people of Vermont that have done the right thing. We've just been trying to guide them. All right, and my next question is for Dr. Levine. Yesterday we had the Brattleboro Police Department report that they had a case where someone's marijuana tested positive for fentanyl, and the police department had received 
communication from Connecticut officials, I believe, or other police departments in New England that, that they're seeing a rise in this kind of situation. And I saw some reports from Connecticut. I'm wondering if Dr. Levine has heard from, from uh, public health officials in Connecticut about this issue, and if we're seeing this in other areas of Vermont right now. So <clears throat> I am aware of the report from Connecticut, though. Um, have not heard from public health officials uh, from either Connecticut or in our uh, several times a week meetings as health officials across the country. Uh, this hasn't come up, but we were aware of that. And I believe the Brattleboro uh, instance is the only one that's been at least reported to us in Vermont. Again, the message to the public should be um, much like the harm reduction messages we send about opioid use, because of course we're talking fentanyl being mixed in with the marijuana, uh, just like it's been mixed in with heroin and other narcotic substances. So uh, again, if buying products on a, um, f from a marketplace that's not part of a, um, a legalized market uh, is what an individual is doing, they should always be careful with the substance that they've purchased. And certainly don't use a lot at once. Titrate it, use it very small amounts. Make sure it's safe. Make sure you're in the company of others so that if there are problems that arise, you can be assisted. Um, this is just now, unfortunately, an example in a, in a substance that's much more common than the um, illicit narcotics uh, that people have to be careful. So it's a little bit of a wake-up call. Hopefully it's only a, a very random event and it's not uh, going to be seen very frequently. But just the fact that we now have a report of it and it seems like a very credible report, people should be careful. And I just want one, one last quick follow-up. Um, can somebody, are you aware if if someone can overdose from just smoking a little bit of fentanyl with marijuana without like freebasing it, because that question came into us, and I wasn't sure if there was. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, um, and I don't know if we have the science behind that yet to answer that question. Certainly, you can ingest fentanyl orally and people often bake marrow you know marijuana into brownies and cookies and other substances so um, I would still worry about it uh, but I can't directly say that smoking it might have the same impact but I could predict it probably would thanks a lot Lisa the Waterbury roundabout Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, I have a, a data question and a testing question. Um, data has to do with the school um, information, which um, during Courtney's questions a few minutes ago, the uh, new update for this week with the cases in schools was um, updated on the state website. Um, I've got a question about just, I, I can appreciate how this is a bit of an exercise in herding cats, trying to get all these numbers and trying to make them be, um, similar um, and comparable. Um, but in our school district here that we cover um, in the Harwood district, this past week, the update that we received from the schools about our current cases had a caveat on it telling families to basically disregard the state chart because it's so far off. Um, and I'm wondering if other reporters even on this call are noticing this, but it seems like the, the case numbers that are being reported on the state chart um, are really not keeping up with the numbers of cases that are coming in right now. I'm wondering if the problem is, you know, more of a, of a more expansive than what people appreciate at this point. For example, right now the state's reporting that our school district has 15 cases, uh, when in fact the schools have reported 27 cases. Um, I think 26 of those in the time period that the data on the state website is purportedly uh, accurate through. So that's that's about 40, 40, 45% off um, just in one school district. Just 
I'm looking over at uh, <laughs> the two commissioners conferring on this. So I, I can't tell you which number is correct and which number is not. Some of it may be timing. Some of it may be contact tracing that's been done within the school that we weren't yet aware of. Some of it may be related to the fact that we count cases that uh, present in a school and are transmitted within the school and maybe uh, there were cases that were in the community that we would not have included in the school outbreak even though we include them in the case count. I, I can think of a, abundant reasons but if you could send uh, uh, our communications folk the exact information in the exact district we can at least try to chase it down and get an understanding of it. Yeah, so please let us know so we can get to the bottom of it because there probably is a reason for it. Okay, that would be great because um, I think trying to understand that a little better would, be, would actually be helpful and that may be helpful in other places as well. Um, one other question for you, Dr. Levine, has to do with testing and thinking about Thanksgiving coming up. So schools pretty much are going to be out now tomorrow through the weekend. If there's gatherings that families are at, say, Thursday, um, Friday, what's your recommendation as far as, you know, kids will be back in school on Monday. How long should people wait? I know there's a bit of a time period, right, a lag from when you have a gathering to when it's a, a viable thing to take a test and have it be meaningful. Um, how, what's your recommendation as far as, you know, getting kids um, tested before they go back into um, their classroom settings next week? Right, so we generally say testing on day five to day seven would be advisable. Obviously, symptoms test immediately and don't go to school, you know, no matter how trivial the symptoms, but otherwise probably five days after the gathering event, which would be five days from Thursday. Governor, there's a news report that a first grader in the academy school in Brattleboro was vaccinated against the expressed wishes of his parents. Have you or anyone in your administration heard about this? And if so, what steps are you taking to prevent it from happening again? I have not heard that. And I don't know how that slips by because you have to have your parents' permission to do so. So I don't know the circumstances. Um, is Secretary French on? I don't know if you've heard of this or not, Secretary French. Yes, Governor, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, actually, the New Hampshire Commissioner of Education called me to discuss this issue. Um, I haven't been able to confirm it, and I think it's still being investigated. Well, what did he say? He just wanted to alert me uh, that he had heard, uh, I'll say, a rumor of this as well, and he was hearing uh, from people in New Hampshire about what was he going to do about it, basically. Uh, but again, I haven't been able to confirm if this is actually uh, what took place. Okay, thank you. Um, Governor, on the mask mandate bill yesterday, uh, the legislature had an opportunity to remove any possibility of criminal penalties which could be up to a year in jail for a violation of a municipal ordinance, and they didn't. Uh, does that uh, give you a reason for concern? I, you know, I, I understand why it was presented um, technically, uh, but again, we went through this before. We went through this a year ago with the municipalities, and gave them the ability uh, to put these mass mandates in place, um, and there was no uh, issue at that point in time. So I, I'm not expecting that we'll have any problem of that nature, but, uh, but I understand why they, they put it forward. But, but I, 
personally don't have any concern over this. Thank you. Catherine Huffney, WCAX. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, Governor, I believe this is for Dr. Levine. Um, you have mentioned that Vermont is now a countrywide leader in developing these new PCD standards um, and action levels. Uh, were these developed in light of potentially too restrictive levels in Burlington's situation and in the face of coming statewide testing um, that the legislature ordered for schools? These were really developed independent of any of the concerns regarding Burlington. Okay, and do you have any more messaging, I guess, for parents who, who just are really concerned about what their kids are going through going to school in Omezies? Going to school what? Oh, uh, in a Macy's department. Um, I, I really don't. Um, I think the city of Burlington did what they thought was best regarding protecting the health of their kids. They needed an alternate location. They came up with one. Um, I think it's, again, everything our team here on the stage has been saying all along is our kids need to be in school. So even if they're in a building that isn't the school they remember being in, but it is their school, that is far preferable than not being in school. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you again next Tuesday. Have a very happy Thanksgiving and uh, reflect on the, the good things that are happening in the world uh, because there are good things happening. Thank you.